All right, we've got time, to, just uh, in time, I've uh, learned a new term this weekend called technical problem. <laughs> a group of us uh, were heading to the Sky Bar just uh, in around the, here, this area on the, on the Saturday night, or Sunday night, yeah. And uh, we met these bouncers and they, they said, you're going to the Sky Bar? Technical problem. <laughs> they didn't let us go there. So. We, we speculated the rest of the evening as to what the technical problem was. Was it a fist fight? You know, what, what was going on? Or did they just not like us? I, th I think they said that we just, they just didn't like us. Uh, so my name's Todd Little. Uh, I'm uh, Vice President of Product Development for IHS. Um, IHS is not the Indian Health Service. It's a company that's a global company that's invested in uh, data and analytics. I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight, or this, this afternoon here, is uh, Stand Back and Deliver. This is the book that four of us wrote together. The four of us met through conference just like this. Uh, I was organizing the Agile Development Conference in the United States and met up with a number of like-minded, you know, we'd get together in the hallways and start talking about things that were of interest to us. Uh, Pollyanna Pixton, uh, Neil Nicolaisen, and, and Kent McDonald and I said, hey, you know, we've got these ideas and if we pull them together, we've got something that's better than each of us individually and the synergy came together in the form of a book. Uh, the sort of the outline is this uh, model up here where we have purpose, collaboration, and delivery, and around that, the influence that has on decisions we make uh, in the development process. Uh, so yeah, my welcome to India. I am Mr. Toad, or, you know. <laughs> and about IHS, I said, it's not the Indian Health Service, it's actually a company that you have definitely heard from and you probably have no idea who we are. Um, we're the ones that are the information and data behind a lot of things that are going on in the economy. We're the ones that are out there predicting what oil price is gonna be. We're the ones out there telling you what's happening in the military, uh, advice through a company, uh, an acquisition, Jane's. We're acquiring a lot of companies. We are providing and feeding a lot of the data and analytics and decisions that are influencing a lot of uh, major economic risk major decisions that, that companies are making. Uh, we're a global company. Uh, I've been involved in global teams. Uh, one of the reasons I'm here in Bangalore is that we have a very uh, strong facility here in Bangalore. Uh, many of my team are in, in Bangalore. Um, I represent, in my organization, I have uh, nine different sites that we're developing software. And uh, it's, you know, it, we are a global company and we're globally distributed in how we develop that software. So let's start with it. Um, let's start with purpose. I think I always like to lead in with purpose. That's how we lead in in the book. Uh, really, we, we find is if you really know what your purpose is, a lot of other things will flow from it. So purpose is really a, a real key part of software development. So I'm going to start with a uh, movie from, move a little clip from Apollo, Apollo 13. Let's hope this goes. We have sound? What happens to sound? I want you all to forget the flight plan. Uh-oh. From this moment on, we are improvising a new mission. Oh, come on. We'll, Sorry, we'll get somebody to look at that. Got to get the bulb around here. How do we get our people home? They are here. We turn them around, straight back, yes. direct the board. Oh, oh you see the bird. Yeah. Yeah. No, sir, no, sir, no, sir. We get them on a free return trajectory. It's the option with the fewest question marks for safety. I agree with Jerry. Use the moon's gravity, slingshot them around. No, the left will not support three guys for that amount of time. It barely holds two. I mean, we've got to do a direct abort. We do an about face, we bring the guys right home right now. Get them back soon, no, absolutely. We, we don't even know if the Odyssey's engine's even working, and if there's been serious damage to this spacecraft. They blow up and they die. That is not the oh, argument. We're talking about time, not whether or not these guys are oh, I'm not going to sugarcoat this for you. Hey, hold it. Let's hold it down. Let's hold it down, people. The only engine we've got with enough power for a direct abort is the SPS on the service module. Well, Lovell has told us it could have been damaged in an explosion, so let's consider that engine dead. We light that thing up, could blow the whole works. It's just too risky. We're not going to take that chance. In fact, the only thing the command module is good for is re-entry, so that leaves us with dilemma, which means free return trajectory. And once we get the guys around the moon, we'll fire up the LEM engine, make a long burn, pick up some speed, and get them home as quick as we can. Gene, I I'm wondering what the, what the Gremlin guys think about this. 
We can't make any guarantees. We designed the limb to land on the moon. Not fire the engine out there for course correction. Well, unfortunately, we're not landing on the moon, are we? I don't care what anything was designed to do. I care about what it can do. So let's get to work. Let's lay it out. Okay? JT, it's pretty clear what their purpose is here, right? They've got an, a, a problem on the Apollo 13. They've got a purpose. They've got a well-defined purpose. Once you have that well-defined purpose, you see the passion that, 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 that all of the, the members had. They knew what they had to do. Now they're debating over the how, but that's the passion and things. So having that purpose is very critical. Uh, sometimes it's not so clear. You know, we say powerful questions are, what are we building? What business are we in? Too often what we get are, what building are we in? <laughs> so what do we do about this? So software is, is a, lot less a lot more malleable. It's not so clear as you got to get a guy back from the, from the aborted space mission. So what we start looking at is one of the things you really need to do as an organization is figure out where are you going to make your differentiation? Where are you going to be specialized? Because you can't be everything to all customers. You can't be everything. So this is something uh, in the very beginning. It's out of uh, uh, Tracy and Weirsman, I believe. Uh, and the idea is where are you going to specialize? Are you going to be a cost leader? Are you going to be a product leader? Or are you going to be a cu best customer solution? Those three areas, are you going to be really intimate with your customers? In which case, you have a particular business model that you need to work with with that. Cost leader, you're going to be like um, an Amazon. You're going to be the cost leader. And, and, make, and the other part of this is cost, you can sometimes be a little bit of two of these. Amazon's a cost leader, low cost, and also making sure that they've got very tight ties with customer delivery, making sure the feedback loops are fast. Or you're going to be a product leader, probably more in the space that Apple's in. Product leadership is a big part of what they're about. The next thing we look at is the purpose alignment model. And this is the model that came from Neil Nicolaison. Um, and we look at two quadrants here, or, or two, two axes on four quadrants. Uh, first, we look at market differentiation on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we look at mission criticality. And based on that, we try to figure out where are we going to be differentiating, where are we in the category where we're low, low um, if we start through here, if we're low mission critical and low market differentiating, why are we doing it? Eliminate it, minimize it. This is one of the key things, I think, when I come up with, the, with looking for an organizational strategy or where is our strategy, one of the key tests that I have for a good strategy is it tells me when to say no. If I have a strategy and everything fits in the strategy, is it empowering in any way whatsoever? No, because I'm just doing everything. The best way for us to really focus and make a difference is be able to eliminate the things that aren't so smart. We want to do more smart stuff and less stupid stuff. And the things that are down there that have no low mission criticality or low market differentiating, we want to minimize or eliminate. The other side of that is the things that are really differentiating that's where we want to innovate and create. Uh, those things that are parity, we call them parity, the things that are low market differentiation. We, but on the other hand, it's mission critical that we have it or that we're involved in it. So something like an, if you're a company, you must have a way to pay your employees. Now, are you going to recruit better people because you have the absolute best way to pay the employees? If you're really bad, you have to be good enough at it. You've got to pay your employees. But you don't have to be gold-plated. You want to do this at parity. You want to achieve and maintain parity. You want to mimic your competitors. You want to look at who's doing this really well and do it about that well. That's all you have to do. That frees up your intellectual capital to work on the things that are really going to be differentiating. And then the other quadrant is one where you're looking to see, we call it partnering, it's not mission critical that we do it, but it's potentially market differentiating. And in that case, we're looking for what type of partnership might we be able to do. It's a really simple model. It's, not, it, it, it's actually even pretty easy to implement in reality. What I'm going to do is, is uh, what I like about it is that I see that it's applicable at a lot of different levels. Corporate strategy, even product strategy, and even down at the feature level. It scales down pretty well. Let's take a look at this from a company pretty well known is Apple. So where's Apple at in this? 
what are the really core competencies of Apple? They're really good at new product development. They come out with new products on a regular basis. We'll see if they're able to keep up with that. They've got a lot of new competition. Sometimes what was new, oftentimes what was new becomes parody. So, you know, they've got a, they've got a lot of competitors out after them. But the, that's their, their, what they're really good at is being able to pipe out, pump out new products. They're really good at design, really good at the user experience. And then through iTunes and, uh, have been really good at, and the App Store have been really good at content distribution. So they've built up networks around that. What are some of the things that are parity? Well, when they were building the Mac, they weren't at parity with the Windows platform. So they worked, they did some partnerships with Microsoft, so they had uh, MS Office available on the Mac. Uh, they which went over to Intel hardware, which was competitive, which was parity with what was uh, popular in the Intel platform. Uh, and a lot of other software became just parity to them. Partnership, when they first came out with the iPhone, they signed an exclusive agreement with AT&T for the network. They didn't have to be a network provider, but by creating a partnership, they were able to capture market value more so than if they'd made it open. Uh, it was what they believed. They believed they could capture that market. As com competition changed, they moved away from its exclusive with AT&T, and then um, it no longer was a partnership, and they captured market value in a different manner. And then the who cares, they were involved in peripherals and pretty much got out of that space. So we move through these things. The next side, is once you've got the purpose pretty well understood, if you know what you're doing, a lot of other things flow nicely. But a key to it also is do you have an environment where people can collaborate? Because if you have all of the people working together collaborating, if you have the, in, you've engaged the entire organization, uh, so much you can then make sure that that purpose is uh, fulfilled. So I love this from Alexei Kravitsky, the version of the Agile Manifesto, blah, 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 blah. Individuals interactions over processes and tools, blah, 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 right? It is really all about individuals interactions. Knowledge work is about individuals and how you empower individuals in order to make and fulfill on the purpose and uh, direct your long-term sustainable competitive advantage. You get really good people, you can build really good products and really good services. An old school leadership model is one that responds to change, knows the answer, it's bureaucratic, it's all top down, leader decides, authoritarian, uh, and we oftentimes call this command and control. Uh, I've been fortunate, had some good, very good discussions with Sean Dunn on the whole concept of command and control and, and the, the misuse that we have in almost all of our industry and how we interpret what, we mean, what command and control means. You know, the military has a very clear definition of what command and control looks like, and it's not at all about micromanagement. And if we look at the old school, we've turned that into micromanagement, and that's, that's what really is the challenge, uh, micromanagement. Let's take a look at sort of a military view of command and control. Let me have to do this again. Let's see if it's... You may dispense with the pleasantries, Commander. I'm here to put you back on schedule. I assure you, Lord Vader, my men are working as fast as they can. Perhaps I can find new ways to motivate them. I tell you, this station will be operational as planned. The Emperor does not share your optimistic appraisal of the situation. But he asks the impossible. I need more men. Then perhaps you can tell him when he arrives. The Emperor's coming here? That is correct, Commander. And he is most displeased with your apparent lack of progress. We shall double our efforts. I hope so, Commander, for your sake. The Emperor is not as forgiving as I am. <laughs> So, very much fear-orientated. Um, 
this is a follow-on to the second book that Pollyanna's written. I was involved in helping coll uh, collaborate with her, but I wasn't an author. Uh, Pollyanna and Neil went on to write another book and partner with Paul Gibson. Paul Gibson is the uh, one who started with this trust ownership model. I think it's a really good place to, to look at how teams oriented. On the, on the left axis, we have trust at one end and control at the other. Uh, more a, a taking control away, or taking trust away, lack of trust, really. And on the other side, we have team ownership. Is the team owning uh, the problems that they have? And here at the low end, where we have low ownership from the team and low uh, control, or and a control environment, or a lack of trust environment, is the micromanagement, command and control type model. If we move away from the team tries to take ownership, but the leader is not allowing the team to take ownership, then we have a very conflicting environment. The team wants it, but the, owner, the, but the leader doesn't let them have it. And so they're, they're just fighting on a regular basis. So we can't actually, it is impossible for the team really to take that ownership and hold it for any period of time. On the other side, we've got a team, that's, a leader that says, OK, team, I trust you. And the team goes and becomes country club. They don't actually do anything. So the leader in this case has abandoned or abdicated responsibility and has allowed the team to just flounder Without, without encouraging and um, being able to take the team to bring and take that ownership. And if we can get the team and the leader to work in concert so that they have a high trust environment and high ownership by the team, that's where we get uh, empowerment and innovation. So how do we get there? And again, I'll look at the, I like another model, and this is a model that's used by Henrik Nieberg in the uh, Spotify video. It's a very similar perspective, but just a little bit different nuances. Uh, in this case, it's looking at the autonomy of the team and then alignment on the other side. And so in the lower quadrant, again, we have the, the uh, command and control because we have low alignment and low autonomy. Everything's being told down. And we really want to get to a, a level of aligned autonomy where the team is able to take ownership, then they're aligned in the direction that makes a, a very positive direction. So with that, what we'd like to do, we're wanting to get in an environment where we're embracing change, fostering new ideas, collaborating, where give, the leader is giving ownership and encouraging the team to take ownership, and it's influential. So let's look at, um, again from Apollo 13, example of a team taking a little bit of ownership. Should I am or PM? AM. Very, very AM. Dave is running a temperature, and none of them has slept I since the explosion. I can't order these guys to go to sleep. Did you sleep up there? It's going to get awful cold in there for those guys. Gene, we have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb. Which are meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. They're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15, and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. The ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. It just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. this this one and we got to come through we got to find a way to make this fit into the hole for this using nothing but that let's get it organized okay okay let's build a filter better get some coffee going too someone so this is what i call the um we call it the leadership dance because the leader has to step up and say, "This is what we. This is the problem we've got." Very, very clear. We haven't. We know what the problem is. The leader doesn't tell how to do it. You empower and get some collaboration to figure out the how. So part of this is what do you need to do in order for this to happen? First of all, you've got to get the right people. To get the right people, you got to figure out what is your mechanism to to bring in those right people. And this is a model that that Pollyanna brings to the table, really uh, based on some of the uh, work in Good to Great. What you're looking for is finding the right people that have the passion, the ability, and the organizational fit. If you can get people in that area, look at that, there's nothing, in, 
you know, you have to have a minimum ability, but we're not looking for the best technical person, right? We're looking for the best fit across the board of those areas. Do we have the passion? Are we motivated? Do we have the integrity? Do we have the ability to do the job? Or do we have the ability to train them to do the job? And then are they an organizational fit? You find that, you get the right people. Like I said, I started to talk about the leadership dance. You saw that Gene Kranz, who's the, the, the mission control leader uh, on Apollo 13, was very clear about stepping up and saying, yes, we have a problem, and our problem is we've got to do this, which they probably already knew it, but it was really clear. They've got to figure out how to get the CO2 levels redu reduced, and they have some constraints around that. The real problem solving begins at that point, and it's a collaborative effort. They all get together in the room, and they look and say, here's our problem. We know what it is. We know why we're doing it. Now let's solve it. The leader steps back. Gene Kranz wasn't in the room doing that. It was the team. Sometimes the leader can get involved, but basically the leader needs to step back because they're actually, oftentimes the leader knows less about what needs to happen than the, than, than the rest of the collaborative work, the way he's doing the work. When we collaborate, individuals step up to volunteer for what and when. We don't push that down. So when we have in, individuals take that on, amazing things happen because of individuals that hold themselves accountable and they'll, they'll actually follow through very well. So here's an example. I call Agile Leadership. Yep, yep. Back door, yep, huh? Good idea. Yep, yep. Yep, two, five. What's helping me get? Oh, yeah, come over here. Back door. What the hell? It's only a few guards. This shouldn't be too much trouble. Oh, oh. Well, it only takes one to sound the alarm. Then we'll do it real quiet like. Oh, oh my! The Princess Leia! I'm afraid our furry companion has gone and done something rather rash. Oh, no. There goes our surprise attack. Not bad for a little fur ball. There's only one left. You stay here. We'll take care of this. I have decided that we shall stay here. So you saw an innovation, you saw the team get together, collaborate a little bit. Then you saw some initiative. They went off and they did something, right? They took some action. And most important, they convinced the manager it was his idea, right? <laughs> Great teamwork and they got the job done. So now we work on, you've got the team, you've got the purpose, you've got a team built, you've got teams that can collaborate. Now how do we deliver? What's the model for delivery? So um, people familiar with the Wizard of Oz here, nice a bit of Americana. You know, it's not terribly important that you know. We used a little clips from that. So in our project kickoff, we have little Dorothy saying, oh, when will we get the requirements? All in good time. Might as well put the all in good time. That's the wicked witch telling him that. Yeah. But I guess it doesn't matter anyway. Ah, just give us your estimates by this afternoon. Anyone heard that one? Yeah. The team binds together. Not so fast! Not so fast! I'll have to give the matter a little thought. Go away and come back tomorrow. No, we need something today. Okay, then it'll take two years. No, we need it sooner. Doesn't anybody believe me? I already promised the customer it'll be out in six months. You're a very bad man. Oh, we're not in Kansas anymore. The developer hero. I may not come out alive, but I'm going in there. They've just about got things under control. And what do we have? The reorg. The great and powerful Oz has got matters well in hand. My, people come and go so quickly here. All right, then they keep persevering, and now they're going into testing. <laughs> going so soon? I wouldn't hear of it. 
Why, my little party, just beginning. And too many software projects operate under this environment. And this is uh, why we like to look for what are some of the creative solutions. So here's, here we look at the, uh, how did the Apollo 13 crew do it? Or the ground crew. The deadly CO2 gas is literally poisoning the astronauts with every breath in and out. Heads up, heads up. And people will not comment further on the Go, 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 go. Heads up, people, look out now. What's this? That's what they gotta make. Well, I hope you got the procedures for me. Right here. That's it? Affirmative, Andy. Uh, Jack's got one right here. Okay, we have a uh, an unusual procedure for you here. We need you to rip the cover off. I want you to rip the cover off the flight plan. With pleasure. All right, now the other materials you're going to need here are uh, a lithium hydroxide canister. We need two lithium hydroxide canisters. I'm sorry. Uh, All right. So. What you see is they, they came up with solutions. How do we get to these creative solutions? Delivery is getting the teams together. So one thing that I, I love, and this is a video clip of um, John Cleese. John Cleese was from uh, movie star, TV star, Monty Python, um, nearly headless Nick from the Harry Potter series. He was doing a set of management videos. And this particular management video, I just absolutely love. It came out in the mid-1980s or so. And when I viewed this, I said, this is probably one of the best best descriptions of Agile development I've ever seen. Thank you. Gordon, the guided missile, sets off in pursuit of its target. It immediately sends out signals to discover if it's on course to hit that target. And, and the signals come back. No, you are not on course, so change it up a bit and slightly to the left. And Gordon changes course as instructed and then rational little creature that he is, he sends out another signal, am I on course now? And back comes the answer, no, but if you adjust your present course a little bit, a little bit further up and a little bit further to the left, then you will be. So he adjusts his course again and sends out another request for information. And back comes the answer, no, Gordon, you still got it wrong. You must come down a bit and a foot to the right. And the guided missile, its rationality and persistence, a lesson to us all, goes on and on making mistakes, and on and on listening to the feedback, and on and on correcting its behavior in the light of that feedback, until it blows up the nasty enemy thing. <laughs> then we applaud the missile for its skill. And then if some critic says, well, it made a lot of mistakes on the way, we reply, yes, but that didn't matter, did it? It got there in the end. All its mistakes were little ones in the sense that they could be immediately corrected. And as a result of making hundreds of mistakes, eventually, the missile succeeded in avoiding the one mistake which would really have mattered, missing the target. That, to me, is the essence of agile development. It's about enabling your teams to be making mistakes and learning from those mistakes so that you can correct it. And that's having that feedback and having that learning is absolutely critical. So, and I'm, I'm actually a chemical engineer by background. Uh, chemical engineers uh, deal with control systems. And I actually view this as a control system environment. So um, the thing I've found in the world is people tend to be in one of two camps. Either you believe that you can control outputs by controlling inputs, or you believe you can, you can measure outputs and control the system by the measurement of the out outputs. I think the traditional approaches have all focused around the idea, if I can control my inputs and control my processes, I can then control my outputs. Chemical engineers tried this in chemical plants. A lot of them blew up, right? They, they, it doesn't work. It's, it's an unstable environment. What found out to work much better is if I don't worry so much about the inputs, I accept that inputs are going to be random, but I really focus on having a very strong feedback loop around my outputs. I do my control systems based on the outputs, and then adjust, make the set adjustments in the uh, behaviors in order to get that. That's what really works, and that's what's running most chemical plants in the world, that type of approach. This is very stable, works very well. It's also really, I think, what agile leadership is about. Focus on outputs 
kind of adjustments based on outputs. Focus a lot less on predicting forward, forward from inputs. If we go back to the trust ownership model, a lot of this is, and again, we, we work with this idea called command and control, like command and control is a bad idea. I mean, I like control. I want control. Control is a good thing, but control comes in a different form. Control comes from the fact I actually have stable zone of control along the diagonal. I can behave, I can be in that area, in any one of those areas I can be controlled. I can't be in the conflict because once I'm in conflict, it's an unstable environment. Similarly, abdication is doomed to failure if I allow it to be there too long. But anywhere along the diagonal is actually the zone of control. And I want control, but I want good control. I want the energized control. I don't want the control that's, that's the micromanaged version of control. The work, look at that, um, one thing that I've looked at is something called the context leadership model. Here we're looking at the two of the axes that really impact us in, our, in how we uh, deliver projects. The uncertainty scale on the project, both from a business and technical perspective, and then the complexity side in terms of the uh, number of people on the, pro on, the, on the project, the distribution, the, knowledge, the domain knowledge that's available to the team. And if we look at these four areas, we have what we call sheepdogs, colts, cows, and bulls. So go through them a little bit here. Oh, first, first, just some examples of things that are parts of, of uncertainty and complexity. Uh, you can look at this. Uh, let's move on to this. So here we have the different types. So the, the, the low so uncertainty, low complexity, these are what we call sheepdogs. They're really relatively small projects. They're not a hot, whole lot going on with them. You can be very laissez-faire. You can take a very simplistic approach to uh, project and uh, scaled project management. We have the uh, high uncertainty, low complexity. We call these the colts. They've got a lot of energy. They tend to be young. Uh, this is a place where we've had some really good, in the early days when we developed this model, we had some really good experience with uh, things like extreme programming, where it was really one team, one team type scaled uh, model. Look at the bottom corner, we have the complex mature products. Um, these are large-scale projects. They're very complex, but they don't have a lot of uncertainty. They're typically mature products that have been out there. Oftentimes, they're the cash cows of the organization. They need a different style to them. They need a little bit more. Uh, they don't move as fast, so, but they have a lot of complexity. So they, you really need to work on managing the interfaces. And then in the upper quadrant, we have the high uncertainty, high complexity projects. These are the bulls. They're not so well controlled. They make a lot of damage when they run around. Um, but they're also very high visibility and very important. We look at these, and one of the things that I like to do when I'm, when I'm looking at my overall scale, I like to see, can I decompose my projects? So overall, I may have a large uncertainty. I have a, a bull-type uh, program, but, and this is an example that uh, Pollyanna had from uh, her days in the Swiss Stock Exchange. The overall program was really, it was something new. It failed twice before she had gotten involved in it. It's very high uncertainty, very large-scale project. Um, but she could decompose it, so she treated the, the part that was really had the high uncertainty, but it was a small team, dealt with that as a cult. It was the client side of the, of the system. Uh, the the back-end server was a mature product. Uh, they were having to make some updates to it, but they could treat it differently, and then they had to work the interfaces on it. So we could decompose it, and by decompose it, you could work with each one of them slightly differently. And the style of leadership changed based on, on the uh, type of team that was involved in working it. The other thing we, we did with this was looked at uh, how your portfolio looks. And one of the things, it's not bad at all. In fact, it's quite good to have a large number of dog projects because they don't have to, they can be small. I, in my current situation, I've got a lot of small teams that are working on supporting a large business, but they're all small. They're not interconnected. It's really good. It works out really well. I can keep those teams. They're independent, and they can work independently. I don't have to worry about a scale problem. My scale problem is very simple. I have very few things that are having connections in between. So, uh, having a lot of dogs is perfectly fine. The one thing you've been really careful with, you find there's very few leaders that are capable of leading bull projects. It takes very special skills to be able to lead that high uncertainty, high complexity. You don't want a portfolio that has more projects than you have people who could lead those projects. We also found that typically products, we're, I come from a product-based uh, or, orientation, uh, so we found that when we're in the product life cycle, products tended to have uh, pads. They might start as a, uh, a dog or, or sometimes a skunk. It's a, you may have a little bit of high uncertainty, but very small team. 
uh, as it gets up, it eventually may become a bull. Once it, it really has hit the market, it starts to slow down development. It might move down into cows, and eventually may move back as we, uh, uh, into a sheepdog. What we found didn't work very well is the times when we started projects as bulls. I mean, starting on as high uncertainty and high complexity, that means, you know, this thing that's going to save the company, let's throw everybody on it, those, those fail fairly frequently. But if we started it as a, a smaller project and let it uh, evolve, we were much more successful. The other part of this that I've looked at, this is a similar model to, to our purpose alignment model, but it's actually a model from uh, Jeffrey Moore looking at products from, the, again, this market differentiating height and mission criticality. Products tend to have a, a life cycle here as well. Uh, they move from invent to deploy to eventually we manage them and, and they become the, the, sort of the cash cows there, and eventually we offload them. And looking at it from an approach to change, in the early stages, what we're looking to do is we're looking to create change. This is, um, we're building something brand new. Once we've created change, we want to exploit that change, and we want to embrace change. Eventually, we're wanting to control change a little bit more because the product is reaching the end, you know, its mature state. And at the final state, we want to eliminate that change. And from an approach here as well, early stages may be two guys in a garage. Uh, sort of the core team-based agile is uh, in the embrace change, the single team or, or maybe uh, uh, a little bit more scaled agile. Eventually, this becomes a bit more structured in, in a more mature environment. It can still be quite agile, but it's a bit, you, you're really focusing in different areas. And then eventually, oftentimes, moving towards sunsetting or outsourcing. If we look at leadership development, uh, I like to look at four angles. Uh, we start with people, process, and technology. Those are the three people usually use. I like to add business to that because there's business focus that I find is really critical. Uh, and it doesn't really get covered necessarily from people, process, technology. I was interested in seeing Sean's earlier today because he has the same, not only the same categories, but he's minimized the process part, which I think is actually not a bad idea. Sometimes process takes on too much focus. Um, and uh, you know, if you get your business and your people part together, Strong technical practices, the process almost uh, evolves out of that. So if you look at it from a leadership development, what I've found is that the leader, there are some leaders who are much better at dealing with people in process. They tend to be really good in managing and in, in leading the cows. The other people that are really good at leading with uh, business and technology and handling that uncertainty that's associated with that, they tend to be really good at dealing with the cults. And then there's a special breed of people that are able to handle those high uncertainty, uh, high complexity. The other thing I have found is one of the ways to develop some of those leaders is by taking some of those people that have been really good in the, in the large scale and then cross-training them and giving them into, to try out projects on the, uh, in the cold category in order to get them learning how to deal with the uncertainty. And eventually they can uh, take on the bull type category. With this model, one thing to watch out, not all dogs are the same. Hey, nice dog. Yeah, this is Piper. You're a bred border collie. Watch this. Piper, fetch. <laughs> Good boy, Piper. You're such a smart dog. So, uh, what can your dog do? Fergus, Bud Light. <laughs> Pet dog. Fresh, smooth, real Bud Light. <laughs> Important. It's all here. So the important thing, both dogs delivered, right? and, they, and they did it a little bit differently, right? <laughs> so lastly, I mean, with all of this, what's really important is what are the decisions we're making on a regular basis? And, and a lot of this is, gets back to the business perspective. What are we really trying to optimize? So um, typically, we start with, well, let's deliver by business value. And how do we measure business value? Well, business value is costs and benefits and a calculation, and we end up with this magic thing called business value. OK, what really happens? Well, eventually, we really have an estimate, and we have some fabrications about the business, about the benefits. So yeah, we do it all this time to make estimates on the cost. We fabricate the value and uh, run it through a calculation and justify the project. Um, this is really not, I mean, it, it's not a number. That's the whole point of, of uh, this. What we found is it's much better to, have a, to recognize the business value model is really a conversation. And the conversation starts with purpose. It starts with understanding what your purpose is, 
understands what the considerations are. Yes, cost and benefits come into it, but it's a conversation, and that conversation is trying to influence what are the decisions, actions, and intentions. Okay? So we look at a little bit here, my, my little rocket ship. We start with a bunch of ideas coming in. We have these various filters that we're coming through, and so we have that purpose alignment filter. As we have the purpose alignment filter, we can eliminate some things that aren't strategic. They don't really fit. We, some things will come through it. Then we have another filter to you know, roughly understand what the values and costs are. And we do some prioritization. And that the prioritization, some become the critical ideas, and some become things we can defer until later. This is one part of that, that model that you can use. Um, the considerations can be things like just risks, assumptions, and constraints. Some of the risks we want to look at, we want to, what types of risks? What are the places of uncertainty? Do we have cost uncertainty? Do we have some general market uncertainty? We don't know. I mean, where, what's oil price going to be next year? What's it going to be two years from now? These are general things that aren't really things that we can influence directly. And then there's other parts. What's the feature? The features that we're building, how well will they be taken up in the marketplace? We don't have to find where is the big uncertainty that we're dealing with? The conversation. It's very clear identifying what the constraints are. Referring back also to the purpose. What's the purpose? We've got to get these people back safely, right? And these are the constraints. What's the most important one? They found it. Power was it. Have the conversation. Ultimately, it's the decisions we're making. You know, what do we do? When do we do it? And when do we decide? This key part of you know, when, I like to look at something called the cost of delay as well when we're having that decision. Because so often we, we focus so much on, well, the date is this. But really, what conversation do we want to know? We want to really understand, well, what sort of market situation are we in? Because we don't want to necessarily absolutely fix the date. Some people say in Agile, you absolutely fix the date, and then you ship whatever you got. Is that the smartest thing? It may be, but it may not be. Sometimes there may be really cases what you're really trying to do is optimize those trade-off decisions, have the conversation, the adult conversation around how important is the date? What's it, what do we really have? In the United States, if you're in the gaming industry, you've got a market opportunity to hit something at Christmas time. You miss that, you're pretty much in trouble. That date's pretty important. Or we're having some software developing for the, uh, for the World Cup. We're not ready for, for what, the game is uh, tomorrow, right? Yeah. So <laughs> big game tomorrow. We're not ready for that. You know, it's, it's a bad thing. But sometimes, you know, in a mature market, we're, we have type curves that value doesn't depreciate that much over time, maybe like that C category. If that's the case, we want to have that constant conversation between the team and the business. What are we really trading off here? What is that, that uh, conversation? And how do we set ourselves up appropriately with the commitments that we make? We come back to it again. The whole idea is that this is a conversation. It's a conversation, understanding it, and having the adult conversation, having it collaboratively with all the people and stakeholders that matter. So really, just in summary, make sure you've got your purpose understood. The tool to do that is a collaboration. Of the uh, um, purpose alignment model is one tool that's really helpful for that. Uh, collaboration, work together to have your team and harness the entire uh, intellectual, pro the intellectual value of your, of your people. Um, understand how you're going to deliver and structure. What's the, how do you scale your, your uh, delivery process? And then en enable your team to have the conversations to make decisions that are influencing many of the micro decisions that they're making. And we, we think in terms of, of decision filters. Have we properly uh, educated the team as to why, the why behind everything they're doing? If they understand the why behind it, they can make a whole lot better decisions. With that contact information, I'll be around all, all week here. Uh, book, Stand Back and Deliver. Love to talk to you all. I think we have another session here in about 15 minutes where you get to ask me anything, I think, is what the, the conversation. Uh, and uh, probably got a, a few, few minutes that we can take a couple questions if you've got some. Any questions? Saving all the questions for later. <laughs> OK, I guess we take a, 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 we're coming back. We probably have to take the wall down too, right? I don't know. Not sure. Okay, thank you very much.